Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Pearl Grimes. I am the founder and director of the Vitiligo and Pigmentation Institute of Southern California and the Grimes Center for Medical and Aesthetic Dermatology. I'm also a clinical professor of dermatology at UCLA. And it is truly my honor and pleasure to present this year's Crutchfeld Annual Dermatology Lecture. So today we're going to talk about advances in the pathogenesis and treatment of vitiligo. These are my disclosures. And other than having spent the overwhelming majority of my medical career working on um, disorders of pigmentation from the basic science and clinical perspective. I have no conflicts in giving this talk today. So when we think of vitiligo, the first point that I'd like to establish is vitiligo has an equal incidence in darker versus lighter skin types. And unfortunately, from a historical perspective, there's been a myth and the myths suggest that it's much more common or almost exclusively seen in darker skin types. So we wanna dispel that notion now as we go forward. And regardless of whether or not an individual has lighter skin or darker skin, vitiligo no doubt is one of the most psychologically devastating conditions that we see. Uh, in dermatology. It impacts an individual's self-esteem, self-worth. There are multiple, multiple studies from around the world have documented the impact on quality of life. We just completed a global study of 3,000 541 patients from multiple countries around the globe. And for every country that uh, where patients were included, the story is the same. Patients have a, pro this disease has a profound impact on one's quality of life. Moreover, if you compare vitiligo patients to control groups, there appears to be a significantly higher incidence of depression as well as anxiety related to the impact of vitiligo on patients' lives. So with that as a background, what about what, what do we think of when we consider the differential diagnosis of vitiligo? In most instances, I think we can say, we can make the comment that when we see these completely depigmented white patches of skin compared to normal skin, I think the diagnosis is fairly straight, straightforward. However, in some instances, we have to consider other, other conditions. So what are some of the common conditions that may be confused with vitiligo? Certainly the hypopigmented variety of tinea versicolor, uh, severe cases of post-inflammatory hypopigmentation, even depigmentation. In the pediatric population, children who have severe cases of pityriasis alba, this can be confused with vitiligo. Nevis depigmentosis, which can occur along a dermatomal distribution, just as we see in cases of segmental vitiligo can be confused. But we know that if we do a biopsy, in, ne in nevus depigmentosis, there are melanocytes at the basal layer of the epidermis, whereas in vitiligo, the melanocytes are absent. In nevus depigmentosis, the defect is in the ability to transfer the pigment to the cell to the keratinocytes above. Very often, I frequently see cases of hypopigmented mycosis fungoides, that have not been worked up. And these patients will present to our clinic with the diagnosis of vitiligo. I just had a case two weeks ago. And certainly uh, cases of leprosy in rare instances can be confused as well. I don't want you to forget about comorbidities because this is a key issue. Vitiligo is associated with multiple or a spectrum of other autoimmune conditions. I have a list of these conditions as you see here thyroid disorders, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, Graves' disease, alopecia areata, inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, 
diabetes mellitus, rheumatoid arthritis, pernicious anemia, Addison's disease, but certainly the most common associated or comorbid autoimmune disease that you are likely to encounter in your patients with vitiligo will be Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is number one. Graves number two, alopecia areata. Those are probably, uh, they're in the top tier. So what about the pathogenesis? So I think that when you think of the pathogenesis of vitiligo, I want you to think of the, of the trifecta, the trifecta of genetics, oxidative stress, and autoimmunity. We know that if you pull populations of patients with vitiligo from around the world, anywhere from 20 to 35% of patients will have other first and second degree relatives with vitiligo. There have been many, many genetic studies on uh, vitiligo in the past 10 years. So what have we learned? The overwhelming majority of genes that are associated with vitiligo are what we call immune susceptibility genes that impact the innate uh, and the adaptive immune response. And very often the very genes that we think are playing a role in vitiligo, we see these genes being operative in other autoimmune, comorbid autoimmune conditions that we see in vitiligo. We think that in individuals who have that immunogenetic predisposition, oxidative stress is a key player. If you look at the melanocytes from patients with vitiligo and you compare them to the melanocytes of healthy individuals, it appears that there are clearly uh, defects in the endoplasmic reticulum of patients who have vitiligo. We also know that cells do not handle oxidative stress well and the the retic system in general is deficient. There is a decrease in oxidative enzymes, glutathione, thi uh, thioredoxin uh, reductase, catalases increased, uh, hydrogen peroxide can be increased. So when these cells are stressed, they can give rise to an increase in uh, heat shock protein production, damps, exosomes, which then drive uh, aberrancies in the innate and adaptive immune response. And the final pathway is what you're seeing here. We see an influx of activated autoreactive CD8 lymphocytes, which then migrate into the skin in response to antigenic stimulation. These cells release interferon gamma, which binds to its keratinocyte receptor, activating the JAK-STAT pathway, recruitment, uh, production of chemokine CXCL9, CXCL10, which binds to its receptor to drive the influx of CD8 uh, autoreactive lymphocytes, which mediate the final destruction of the melanocyte in vitiligo. And being able to delineate this pathway has opened the door for us. And we now have our first FDA approved drug for repigmentation, which we'll talk about in the latter part of uh, this lecture. So what about the diagnosis of vitiligo? In general, the diagnosis is fairly straightforward. It can be made on the very clinical features that uh, the stark contrast of the depigmented patches compared to normal skin. This is pretty straightforward. However, uh, in some instances, this depigmentation may not be so straightforward. And we do not hesitate to do biopsies of the involved and uninvolved skin for comparison. And I think this is very important. If you're looking at what is happening in melanocytes versus the normal skin, I, well, if you're trying to characterize what is happening in the depigmented patches, I think you really want to be able to compare it to normal skin, adjacent normal skin. Given the association of vitiligo with a spectrum of comorbidity, morbid autoimmune diseases. This is our standard workup here at the Institute. We do a CBC with the differential, 
comprehensive metabolic panel. I think thyroid function tests are essential. Thyroid antibodies are also important because very often you can see a, you can, a patient can present with thyroid antibodies. The thyroid function tests are still normal. However, if you follow that patient, um, our data, as well as data in the literature, suggests that if you have an antibody, those patients are at greater risk, no doubt, of developing overt thyroid disease. 30% of patients who have vitiligo will also have a positive, will have positive anti-nuclear antibodies. Now, you can ask, well, gosh, are these patients at an increased risk of developing lupus? Lupus tends to be one of the least common autoimmune diseases that we see. Certainly that's what we've seen in at the Institute in the last 30 years. We'll pick up a few, but certainly thyroid disease is much more common. So we view these antibodies as a marker of an aberrant autoimmune response. And in rare instances, we do pick up lupus. So if that titer is greater than one to say uh, uh, 640, um, those papers, patients, I may well refer for a rheumatologic evaluation. And if it's higher, then I'm much less likely to treat those patients with phototherapy. So uh, we've given you a, a general background. So let's talk about therapeutic interventions. Given what we know about vitiligo, I think therapeutic intervention requires a multimodality approach. We must stabilize those patients who have rapidly or moderately progressive vitiligo. We must achieve repigmentation, and then we have to be able to maintain it long-term. So how do we do that? We have to decrease the aberrant oxidative stress that I mentioned earlier. We must decrease the aberrant immune response, and we must stimulate melanocyte regrowth and proliferation and migration back into the areas of depigmentation. So what are our therapies for stabilization? We have a number of tools in our toolbox. Uh, certainly oral mini pulse dosing using dexamethasone is currently used around the world. The dose is usually between two to four milligrams of dexamethasone on two consecutive days per week. We will use this for on the average six weeks. Sometimes I'll use it for up to three months if necessary, if necessary. but in general, most patients will stabilize by six weeks. Studies in the literature suggest that methotrexate is effective, minocycline. I like intramuscular uh, triamcinolone because many patients don't like taking pills on a regular basis, and this is very effective. One injection will stabilize for up to six weeks, and it can be, we, we, have, we can repeat it for up to three injections. The only caveat in women, it can cause some menorrhagia in less than 5% of women. So if I'm using it in a female I, uh, uh, who is uh, menstruating, I'd make the patient aware of uh, this issue. Narrowband UVB is phenomenal at achieving stabilization, and there are studies suggesting that it's probably superior to uh, minocycline, and a recent study suggesting that it may well be superior over time to stabilization that can be achieved with oral mini pulse dosing. And uh, I am a firm believer in the ongoing use of oral antioxidants for patients with vitiligo on and off phototherapy, given what I uh, described as the aberrant redox system in patients uh, who have uh, who, who were affected by vitiligo. So this is uh, Dr. Pandya's work in looking at oral mini pulse dexamethasone dosing for narrow band. So they used dexamethasone, phototherapy, and topical steroids and compared it to a group of patients just treated with narrow band UVB. Uh, the, the stabilization response was significantly greater, i.e. arrest of disease activity in the combination group 
receiving narrowband clobetasol and orodexamethasone on two consecutive days per week. So uh, I think the take home message here is if you really do, if you have a patient who has active disease, an integral part of therapy is, is, is working to stabilize the disease as you work to repigment. As I mentioned, I'm an advocate, I'm an advocate for vitamin supplementation as well, given the role of oxidative stress. Here I give you a list of, uh, of supplements that are reported in the literature to be effective. And I've given you the dosing. Supp the, these supplements include vitamin B12 and folic acid. And really, if you look at the data from a historical perspective, it all began in the 90s using supplementation from a report by Montes from South America using B12, folic acid, and vitamin C in a cohort of patients with vitiligo. And he reported both stabilization and repigmentation. So other supplements include vitamin D, vitamin E, zinc, ginkgo biloba, and studies on polypodium leucotomus. Now, here at our institute, if I could only have one vitamin for patients, it would be vitamin D. And this is why it is such an important player in melanocyte growth differentiation, but it's all, we've talked about vitiligo being an autoimmune disease. Vitamin D modulates over 2000 genes in the body. It's a major player in inhibiting T cell activation. It's a major uh, immunomodulatory agent, and it's not a vitamin, it really is a hormone. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of healthy vitamin D levels in patients with vitiligo and vitamin D deficiency amongst our patients is rampant. Polypodium leucotomus, multiple studies documenting its efficacy, why it has photoprotective properties, it's a powerful antioxidant, it's a powerful antioxidant, and it also has immunomodulatory properties. Now, I want to tease out vitamin D a little bit more. Again, if we go around the world, there are multiple studies now, and these studies have been reported in the past 10 years. Uh, this is the, the top study is a meta-analysis of 31 studies, which documented uh, a significant decrease in vitamin D levels in vitiligo patients compared to controls. The deficiency was even greater in, in, in indoor workers versus outdoor workers. And in the second study, it was a retrospective study of 101 patients showing that uh, active vitiligo at baseline was more often associated with vitamin D deficiency. And at the six month follow-up, normal patients who at six months had normal vitamin D levels, uh, these patients had significantly greater repigmentation. There's also a, a great study that was published in the last six months out of Brigham in Boston. This study was in 25,000 patients showing that vitamin D as well as fish oil has the, the had a significant relationship in being able to mitigate autoimmune diseases. So again, if you're only going to give your patients one vitamin, I would say check your vitamin D levels and do vitamin D supplementation. So what about our overall therapeutic advances for vitiligo? I'm going to tease this out in two buckets. Standard therapies, and we're going to talk about emerging therapies, but as therapies emerge, I don't want you to forget about the standard therapies that do work for a significant number of patients. What are these therapies? Topical and systemic corticosteroids, the calcineurin inhibitors. We'll talk about a little bit about the uh, prostaglandin uh, analogs, narrowband UVB, eczema laser. Uh, we have an ongoing expanding repertoire of surgical treatments and the emerging therapies. This is the dawn. I think the JAT inhibitors are the new bricks and mortar, and we're going to tease that out. I want to establish a relationship between a future of JAKs and afamelanotide. I think down the road, we're going to see more on the IL-15 biologics. 
platelet-rich plasma, which can stimulate repigmentation. We also use it for hyperpigmentation. And we'll see a new generation of lasers. Now, as we situate these therapies in our toolbox, what are the clinical features that we observe in patients that can impact our therapeutic outcomes? Certainly anatomic site. We know for all studies around the globe on vitiligo, repigmentation of vitiligo, we get our best responses on the face and the neck. Trunk areas are intermediate and we struggle with the hands and the feet. And that is a great, that is a gap in knowledge and a great need. The age of the patient impacts your clinical outcomes. The younger the patient, the better the response. And if you look at responses in the pediatric population, significantly greater than responses in adults, duration of therapy an issue. Uh, well, I don't think it's it's been reported to be an issue in the literature, but I think certainly in our experience, I don't put much weight on duration. We get great responses in patients who have had long-term vitiligo. Uh, duration, du I mean, duration of disease, duration of therapy, that is an issue because there's no quick fix for vitiligo. Patients do not respond to any significant degree in two to four weeks. So if you're counseling your patients, you have to be in for the long haul. And I'll show you some data on that. But again, as I mentioned, duration of disease, we have patients with longstanding disease who have an excellent response to repigmentation. Lesion of white hair is an issue. If you have a lesion of white hair, it suggests that the the stem cells, melanoblasts, uh, those cells in the outer root sheet of the hair follicle, the bulge region have been destroyed. And so it's very difficult to stimulate repigmentation. And also these confetti punctate lesions, this suggests that these patients are, in, are having active vitiligo. So it's very important that you work to achieve uh, stabilization. Uh, just a, a few comments on the topical calcineurin inhibitors. We were the ones here at my institute who introduced these to the uh, the the into the realm of of, of repigmentation therapies for vitiligo, and they're a workhorse, a mainstay for me, uh, and we will continue to use them. So this is a meta analysis of uh, fifty six studies that were identified for. 46 were used in the uh, meta-analysis. And if you look at monotherapy achieved with the calcineurin inhibitors and in those patients who can achieve moderate to mark repigmentation, it's about 57%. If you add phototherapy to the calcineurin inhibitor, uh, regiment marked uh, responses can increase from 18% to 47%. And we now have greater than 20 year data using these agents. Uh, we're not seeing any long-term complica complications. And one of the advantages uh, one of the key advantages relates to the fact that you don't have steroid-related side effects. And as I mentioned, as with many other agents, we have our maximal efficacy on the face and the neck. So if we tease out other aspects of the calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus versus pimicrolimus, I think tacrolimus is a more effective agent. Uh, great for patients who have limited involvement. Again, best on the face and the neck. Uh, some studies suggest that repigmentation may begin sooner than what we see with topical steroids. But overall, I think we can make the statement that most studies suggest that the calcineurin inhibitors have comparable efficacy to your higher potency topical steroids. Uh, certainly, uh, if you're using a topical steroid, you got to go beyond hydrocortisone because it will not work. You got to use a fluorinated steroid. Uh, you can have some burning and stinging, but that usually resolves, and they work great in combination with narrow band UVB. Some studies suggest that there may be better efficacy in darker racial ethnic groups. The calcineurin inhibitors are also great for stable for for maintenance therapy. Uh, this is a study by Cavalli. <coughs> it was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, thirty-five patients. 
placebo and tacrolimus. And once patients achieved uh, optimal repigmentation, twice weekly tacrolimus ointment was effective for maintenance therapy of patches that had previously repigmented. And we have many patients that we place on maintenance therapy with tacrolimus 0.1%. And the goal is to keep them on maintenance. And then I will transition from twice a week to once a week. And then I try to get them off of uh, all therapies to see whether or not they're able to, to maintain repigmentation. This is a recent study that was published on the long-term risk of lymphoma and skin cancers using topical calcineurin inhibitor uh, treatment and phototherapy. This was a multi-center retrospective study of patients receiving six weeks of greater phototherapy data was uh, uh, analyzed from 2001 to 2019. And the bottom line is, if you look at lymphomas, actinic keratosis, melanoma, non-melanoma, skin cancers, the risk of lymphomas and skin cancers were not significantly increased with the calcineurin inhibitors, phototherapy, or when you use these uh, modalities in combination. Uh, if we look at the data on narrow band UVB as, uh, as a key component of our therapeutic regimen, it's the therapy of choice for patients who have generalized vitiligo. It's extremely effective in children and adults. How does it work? It decreases longer Han cells. It increases apoptosis. It impacts melanocyte proliferation and melanogenesis. It stimulates melanocyte growth factors, alpha MSH, endothelin-1, basic fibroblast growth factors. And it's a major player in stimulating the, the maturation of those melanocyte stem cells residing in the bulge, uh, migrating up outer root sheet of the hair follicle uh, to, to repopulate the epidermis, a narrow band, a key player in this process. And this is data looking at phototherapy. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of 35 studies. And if we look uh, at the data, moderate responses were observed in 37% at six months. It increases to 57% at 12 months. Mark response is 19% at six months, 36% at 12 months. And I think <clears throat> one of the take home messages here is patients must be in the game for the long haul. Unfortunately, there are no quick fixes. And again, as I mentioned, maximal repigmentation on the face and the neck, trunk intermediate extremities, third, and then we struggle. We continue to struggle with all treatments on the hands and the feet. And this is the effectiveness. If you're looking at eczema laser therapy, this study looked at eczema laser therapy uh, as a monotherapy <clears throat> or in combination with um, other topical agents. There were 233 patients. <clears throat> this was a prospective randomized study. Eczema laser monotherapy, eczema laser in combination with tacrolimus, pimicrolimus, or halometasone. In this study, exer these combination therapies were significantly more effective for repigmentation compared to eczema laser monotherapy. We here at the Institute, we work with the eczema laser, but we also have this. 311 nanometer titanium sapphire laser. And this is a study looking at the, uh, the efficacy of both of these la uh, lasers. It was uh, a study in 21 patients, 74 paired lesions, and both lasers showed F similar efficacy for patients who had localized vitiligo. Now, why did I include this slide? Because if we look at the eczema laser, very often there's a real gas exchange issue once a year. And so this laser is more like the Energizer Bunny. Bunny you don't have to do gas exchange on an annual basis and the efficacy is comparable. And this is one of our patients treated with the uh, 311 nanometer titanium sapphire laser, and he had very extensive depigmentation with a very excellent therapeutic uh, outcome. Now, for many of you, 
You probably have patients on home phototherapy. We have been active proponents of home phototherapy for vitiligo for many, many years. I've probably been doing it for over 20 years. These are a number of studies from the literature looking at the efficacy and the safety of home phototherapy for vitiligo. And in each of the studies that I have listed here, they demonstrate the, the comparable efficacy of home phototherapy to in office. Now, while I still, and this is one of my patients showing the significant response with home phototherapy. While I still feel that in-office treatment for us is a little bit more efficacious, I don't think we're losing a lot for that patient who cannot come into the office. And this is certainly an issue for the pediatric population. Uh, if patients cannot come in and they really are motivated to do treatment, then we work with our patients. So I have many, many patients on home phototherapy for vitiligo, and I think the efficacy safety profile is excellent. And if any of you have any questions on this, please do not hesitate to contact me and I can walk you through our protocols. Uh, what about the side effects, complications? Acute side effects include itching, erythema, burning, uh, blisters, burning, uh, xerosis. And this can be controlled with simple adjustment in your phototherapy dosing, your protocol. Chronic side effects include freckling, photoaging. And we see significantly less photoaging with narrow band UVB versus uh, the use of PUVA um, uh, several decades ago. And the carcinogenesis rate with narrow band is very low. Here I show you a number of studies from around the world looking at skin cancer rates related to phototherapy, and we see that the incidence is very low. So I really feel strongly that we're not inducing uh, skin cancers uh, with narrow band UVB uh, phototherapy or the eczema laser. What about special considerations in the pediatric population? There are some unique aspects of vitiligo in children versus adults. I've summarized some of these here. Certainly just as we observe in adults, the impact of vitiligo on quality of life in children is substantial. So you must keep this in mind. Children have an increased frequency of first and second degree relatives with autoimmune diseases. Commonly see that uh, in the pediatric population. While the incidence of associated autoimmune diseases may be less, it's still very common in the pediatric population. We have an increased frequency of segmental vitiligo, as you're seeing here, that occurs along a nerve distribution. And we still don't know why this is much more common in the pediatric population versus adults. And clearly, uh, all studies now suggest that there is enhanced repigmentation in the pediatric population population compared to what we're seeing in adults. And this is one of our patients showing uh, she had extensive vitiligo, probably at least 20% of her body surface area. And you can see that pro that significant repigmentation with just 62 treatments of narrow band UVB. Um, I like the prostaglandin F2 alpha analogs as I don't use them as first line, but I use them as second line. We use latanoprost and bimatoprost. Latanoprost is less expensive than bimatoprost. How do these agents work? They increase melanogenesis, they increase melanocyte proliferation, and they also increase the transfer of melanin to epidermal keratinocytes. And this is our bimatoprost study. Unfortunately, the FDA would not allow us to use it on the face uh, in this inv investigator-initiated study. So we had three formulate three 
groups of uh, uh, subjects in the study. One group received bimatoprost mono, monotherapy, second group bimatoprost plus mometasone, third group mometasone plus placebo. We saw our best responses in the combination group of bimatoprost plus mometasone. You can see this before and after here, and side effects were minimal. Now, I want to finish up on emerging therapies. Uh, we're going to talk about JAX in just a second. This is the JAX are now the new bricks and mortar for vitiligo. Ruxolitinib was just approved, and I'm so excited. We made history three weeks ago. Uh, but we're going to see other emerging immune modulatory agents. Kinase inhibitors are under investigation. Uh, Anti-IL-15 biologics, these block IL-15 signaling, which is important in addressing the resident autoreactive CD8 lymphocytes, these memory CD8 lymphocytes that have been shown to live in the skin of uh, patients with vitiligo, and we think that they play a role in reactivation of the disease. Uh, studies by Caroline Lapole's group from Northwestern looking at heat shock protein, uh, a mutant heat shock protein, its effect in counteracting uh, innate uh, immune system activation. And we're going to talk a little bit about MCR. Uh, one uh, R agonist alpha melanotide, which stimulates melanocyte, uh, uh, stimulates uh, melanocyte stem cells. So, um, as I said, ruxolitinib was recently approved. Uh, we know that the disease pathogenesis in vitiligo is driven by interferon gamma activation of JAK-STAT signaling. So I'll walk you through the ruxolitinib data. Uh, this was our phase two data, and this was a dosing study. We used multiple concentrations of the drug, 0.15, 0.5%, 1.5 a day, 1.5 BID. And this is the 24-week, the 52-week looking at facial VASI 75 and facial VASI 90. And what we found in the phase two dosing study was that at 52 weeks, the proportion of patients achieving an FVOC 75 and an FVOC 90, it was highest in the group who were treated with the 1.5% twice a day. And so this is what we took into the phase three trials. So what else did we learn in the phase two studies? More responders were female. There were less than 50. Responders had a disease duration greater than 20 years. They were treated with previous phototherapy. There were no differences in responders based on race, skin type, baseline BSA or disease status, and we pretty much observed the same uh, findings in the phase three study. And it was interesting, responders skewed more towards TH2 cytokine production versus the non-responders that skewed more towards a TH1, TH17 uh, cytokine profile. So these are just some of the before and afters in the phase two face, even some repigmentation here on the hand, significant repigmentation of the chest. So now I'm going to take you into the True V1, True V2, that uh, this is the data that uh, facilitated FDA approval of ruxolitinib. So here we see in True V1 and True V2, at week 24, the FVOC75 was achieved in a significantly greater proportion of patients in the ruxolitinib group versus vitiligo. So, and it's very similar to what we saw with 1.5 twice a day in the phase two studies. Here you have 29.9% uh, for FVOC75 at 24 weeks, comparable in true V2. And if we look at FVOC50, 51, so the studies are, 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 are very identical. FVOC90, 15%, 15%. So ultimately, so we're so happy in that Opsilura, ruxolitinib is now available as a 
tool for repigmentation of vitiligo. So these are images, F. Vasi, um, uh, this patient is see, received, achieved significant repigmentation in the phase three study. This is baseline week 12, and you can see at week 24, he really is uh, almost completely repigmented. What about biomarkers of disease activity? The biomarkers that we look at in vitiligo are CXCL9 and 10. And what we what studies have shown is there is a significant increase in, uh, they're increased in progressive uh, versus stable vitiligo. CXCL10 correlated with VASI scores, uh, higher the VASI score, uh, C, uh, CXCL10 higher in patients with higher VASI score and progressive disease, and they decreased after treatment and improvement. And this is our data from the phase two study looking at CXCL10 uh, levels with the various dosing levels. And we saw the most significant drop in the peripheral blood uh, CXCL10 levels with the 1.5 mill. Uh, percent dose twice a day. So since we now have uh, ruxolitinib that is officially uh, FDA approved and available, how do we use it? Will everyone go on ruxolitinib? Will it be rux, rux, rux? Or will we take a critical look and ask the question, how do we best incorporate it into our therapeutic armamentarium? And how will we use it in combination with some of our existing therapies? I think we will, in many instances, move forward given the need of the patient with combination therapies and protocols. I think narrow band UVB of the therapies here will be so essential because we need it in order to speed up treatment to increase migration of melanocytes from the uh, bulge region of the hair follicle. I think one combination pro protocol that we'll look at in the future is perhaps in combination with afamelanotide. We've been involved in this work. Uh, alpha melanotide is a synthetic analog of alpha MSH. In this study, uh, we've conducted two studies in the United States. Alpha melanotide was used in combination with narrow band UVB versus narrow band UVB as a monotherapy. The combination of narrow band and alpha melanotide was significantly superior to narrow band UVB monotherapy as shown here. And the time to onset of repigmentation <clears throat> was significantly less in the combination group versus the monotherapy group. And I think as we look to where we're going with vitiligo and the gaps in knowledge, I think it is imperative that we look at ways to expedite repigmentation. And I think that <clears throat> this has given us an idea of how we can move forward with combination treatment protocols. For patients who have stable disease, uh, if they're stable for greater than one year, certainly we have a spectrum of autologous grafting procedures that are extremely effective if we choose well. So the ideal candidate is a patient who has stable focal or segmental vitiligo, which is unresponsive to medical therapies. We have a spectrum of, of procedures that are effective. And these procedures include suction blister grafts, melanocyte transplants, I love one millimeter punch grafts, sheet grafts, hair follicle grafts, uh, and non-cultured epidermal suspensions. Maximal results are best achieved when we graft and we use it in combination with phototherapy. Uh, and actually, if you graft a patient who has segmental vitiligo, which burns itself out and is stable in about a year, I think this is one condition where we have the ability to achieve a cure. And this is one of our patients at baseline. This is at two months and four months. And you can see a complete repigmentation, no scarring. And this patient was treated with one millimeter graft. So we talked about the natural history, we've talked about diagnosis, workup, pathogenesis, and 
the spectrum of tools in our toolbox for repigmentation, emerging therapies. And I can honestly tell you that for if we, if I look at my story, having been involved in vitiligo research, care of patients for really almost 40 years, this really is an exciting time to see that we now have, we've made history. We have the first ever drug that is FDA approved for repigmentation of vitiligo, a disease which is so emotionally uh, and psychologically devastating for patients. So we really move forward. We, we've learned from yesterday, we will continue to seek new landscapes of our patients and we continue the vision of new discoveries to, for tomorrow to maximize therapeutic outcomes for patients, again, with one of the most psychologically devastating conditions in dermatology. So I thank you for this first part of, uh, of our talk today. Thank you, thank you.